I used to help out a friend of mine once in a while who owns a huge ranch in South Texas. I think the place is around a thousand acres and it's practically on the border of Mexico. He had eight deer feeders on his ranch. If you don't know, the basic idea behind deer feeders is to draw in and retain game on your land. People will shell out a lot of money to travel to Texas and hunt a prized buck. Anyway, his hired hand got sick and he needed someone to attend to the chores and oversee the property. I volunteered to help him out and he hired me to travel down there for the weekend. There are eight deer feeders and eight deer blinds located on his property. One of my responsibilities was to perform a head count on the deer during the morning and the evening. The big bucks are tagged and the price he charges for the deer is based on the number of points they have. He really had some impressive bucks down there. One evening I made my way to the deer blinds around five in the evening. As the sun began to set, the deer feeders were triggered and started dispensing feed. I began the head count as the deer appeared and started to eat the corn. The deer finished their feeding activity just as the sun was setting. This was right at the beginning of winter, and the sun went down really early and I found myself in the dark. The deer had returned to the underbrush, and I was about to finish my night's work when I heard a rustling sound coming from behind the blind. I had assumed that the deer were done with their feeding, but I wondered if they might be coming back for more. I shut the blind's door and looked through the window to check if any other deer were approaching to feed. Then I shined my spotlight out there to see if I could catch any reflections from their eyes in the surroundings, but I didn't see anything. The noise got louder. I tried to look through the window again, but my spotlight was so dim it was no use at all. I had forgotten to charge it beforehand and the battery was almost dead. Realizing I was unable to see anything, I figured I just needed to leave. But just as I was about to go, I heard a weird vibrating sound that definitely sounded different than a typical deer grunt. It had a higher pitch and it sounded threatening somehow. Whatever I was hearing was outside the blind and sounded like it was walking back and forth beneath me. Although I had heard of sightings of large cats in South Texas, I knew that those sightings were not very common. And the noise didn't sound like the growl of a cougar or anything like that. The sound would vibrate and then almost turn into a hissing noise. I decided I would hole up in the blind for a while and not take a chance with having an encounter in the dark with God knows what. I had always enjoyed helping my friend out, but it seemed like this time on the job I had gotten more than I'd bargained for. As I sat in the deer blind, that weird sound seemed to be escalating outside and I was getting more and more alarmed. I looked out into the darkness, but it was hard to see anything with the moon only about half full. Finally, I caught a glimpse of movement. Something was pacing back and forth just outside the blind. When I say this, it even sounds unbelievable to me, even though I was the one who saw it. The thing pacing around was huge, at least seven or eight feet tall, and had a strange, otherworldly appearance. It looked like a cross between a humanoid and a dinosaur, with a head that resembled that of a lizard. I could feel my heart racing as I realized that I was facing something that didn't seem to be of this world. I tried to keep my breathing steady while I watched the creature pace back and forth outside. I could make out the eyes that were glowing yellow, and somehow I could feel that this thing was very cunning, and I needed to keep my wits about me. It seemed to be searching for something, and I knew that if it found me, I would be in serious danger. As the hours passed, I stayed crouched down inside the deer blind, hoping that the creature would eventually lose interest and move on. But I was pretty sure it had scented me, and I didn't know how much longer I could stay hidden. I was really angry that I hadn't armed myself with a firearm before coming out there. I mostly stayed crouched down, but every once in a while I would look out. After what seemed like hours, I was watching it, and it suddenly came to a complete standstill and seemed to be sniffing the air or something. That's when something shot out from the underbrush and started squealing. I was riveted at the sight of it and realized it was a javelina. The reptile creature immediately sprang into action and went after the javelina with a vengeance. The poor animal was running away squealing like crazy, and then all sound stopped, and I'm sure it was captured. 
I didn't waste a minute to scramble out of the blind and into my truck that was about 100 feet away, and I freaking drove out of there like a bat out of hell. When I got to my lodging, I felt the most exhausted I've ever felt. I spent one of the worst nights of my life, unable to sleep, and just having my mind go over and over the possibilities of what that thing could have been. All I wanted was to get far away from that place. And in the morning, I left. I called my friend and said I didn't know what the hell was on his land, but I wasn't going to stick around to find out. I left that place and haven't been back since. My name is Joshua, and I want to share with you a story about a strange encounter I had in the beautiful Great Smoky Mountains National Park. You see, I've always been fascinated by the mysteries of the wilderness, so I often find myself exploring its wonders. This time, my adventure took me deep into the heart of the park. It was a sunny morning in July of 2014, and I had set out on a hike along the Trillium Gap Trail. The trail wound through dense forests, beside sparkling streams, and past towering mountains. I was hoping to catch a glimpse of some elusive wildlife that called this park home. Little did I know that I was about to encounter something beyond my wildest dreams. As I made my way through the trail, I felt a mix of excitement and anticipation. Suddenly a rustling noise caught my attention. I stopped in my tracks, trying to locate the source of the sound. That's when I saw it, a creature unlike anything I had ever seen before. It stood tall, with dark fur covering its entire body. Its large, muscular frame reminded me of the legendary Sasquatch. At first, I felt a surge of fear shoot through my veins. My heart raced and my breath quickened. I had heard stories about mysterious creatures lurking in these woods, but I never expected to come face to face with one. However, as I observed the creature more closely, I realized it didn't seem aggressive or threatening. Instead, there was a sense of calmness and curiosity in its eyes. The encounter took place near a clearing not far from the trail. I cautiously took a step closer, hoping to get a better look. The creature, seemingly unbothered by my presence, remained still, watching me with an air of intrigue. I could hardly believe my luck a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to study a creature from the realms of myth and legend. Overwhelmed with a surge of curiosity, I decided to take a chance and try to communicate with the creature. I spoke softly, introducing myself and expressing my fascination. To my astonishment, the creature seemed to understand me. It responded with a series of deep rumbling sounds that almost resembled words, though I couldn't decipher their meaning. As the minutes turned into what felt like an eternity, the encounter between the creature and me continued. We communicated in our own unique way, sharing a connection that transcended language. It felt as if we were two beings from different worlds, meeting briefly in this hidden corner of the park. During our interaction, a second person happened upon the scene. It was an elderly hiker who had been exploring the park. They stood in awe, witnessing this extraordinary encounter unfold before their eyes. They remained silent, understanding the significance of this moment. Though they had no direct relationship with the creature or me, they couldn't help but be moved by the experience. Eventually, the creature retreated into the depths of the forest, disappearing as mysteriously as it had appeared. The elderly hiker and I were left standing there, awestruck and filled with a sense of wonder. The encounter had left an indelible mark on us, and we knew that life would never be quite the same. The elderly hiker decided to continue on their journey, their heart filled with gratitude for the glimpse into the extraordinary world that lay hidden within the park. As for me, I couldn't help but feel a mix of joy and sadness. Joy for having witnessed something truly extraordinary and sadness for knowing that many people would never believe my story. As I made my way back along the trail, my mind filled with thoughts of the mysterious creature. It hadn't acted wild toward me, like the bears I had encountered in the past. This creature had displayed a gentle and curious nature, leaving me with a sense of awe rather than fear. It made me question the assumptions I had about the untamed wilderness and the creatures that inhabit it. 
Word of my encounter spread throughout the park, captivating the imaginations of both locals and visitors. Some dismissed it as a mere figment of my imagination, while others eagerly speculated about the existence of undiscovered species in the park. Scientists and researchers even began planning expeditions to investigate further, hoping to uncover the truth behind this mysterious creature. Despite the excitement and curiosity generated by my encounter, there were those who returned home upset. Some hunters and hikers who had spent years exploring the park felt unsettled by the idea that a creature as extraordinary as this one had remained hidden from them. They couldn't help but feel a tinge of disappointment that their own experiences in the park had not been as extraordinary or unique. For me, however, this encounter ignited a newfound passion for the mysteries of nature. I dedicated myself to learning more about the creatures that inhabit our world, both known and unknown. I began volunteering at wildlife conservation organizations and supporting efforts to protect and preserve the habitats of these magnificent creatures. I've been a farmer for almost a decade now. I inherited a small patch of land from my parents that's an hour and a half drive from St. Louis, Missouri. I hail from one of the first families to settle down in the Missouri area, and the land that I decided to call home and establish my roots in has been in our family for generations. It's a scenic outcrop of evergreen pastures that went on for miles in every direction. There was a rather large river on one end, not too far from the farmhouse that provided water to my crops and livestock. And east of my property was a deep forest that was so big it went on to form part of the Mark Twain National Forest. It was this forest, as well as the occasional pest outbreaks, and the drop in the price of livestock that were my biggest headache on the farm. Although the forest wasn't an official border to my farm because technically I owned a large part of it, I would soon come to learn that it was best if I treated it as an official border for the east end of my property, and basically never pass that border. I'll get into that here shortly and you'll understand why. My farm is based in a pretty remote area that is a ways off from any human activity. Actually, that was one of its best attributes as far as I was concerned, but also one of the reasons why no one else in the family wanted it. In a way, I think my parents knew I'd appreciate the solitude and off-the-grid lifestyle it would provide me, which is why they chose me to leave it to in the first place. You had to drive through a maze of dirt roads just to make it to the nearest road, and I honestly liked it that way. But four years into owning the land, I started to lose the occasional sheep to various wildlife that would venture out in search of food. I never did witness what would kill my sheep directly, but I'd find tracks near the site of the kill that gave me a good idea as to what it was, and with the tracks always being canine-like, I knew the local woods harbored some wolf packs. We even had a bear show up on the property once, and although it didn't cause any harm to the livestock, it seemed to be interested in looking around. I had seen it coming from a distance and was safely watching it from my kitchen window, but finally it got bored and left two hours later. Since livestock farming was one of the main ways I made an income, the predators that ventured out of the forest onto my farm prompted me to build a secure enclosure for my sheep, and I also got a sheepdog to keep them safe when they were out grazing. After constructing a proper enclosure for my sheep and getting a sheepdog to keep an eye on them, the casualties all but stopped. Not that the occasional forest animal didn't come wandering in every now and then. Now, I know I just said that the casualties all but stopped, but that was only until April of 2012. This was around the time my sheepdog named Jack started to get really worked up come dawn every day. I would bring him inside with me after we had directed the sheep back into the enclosure around 5 p.m. every day, but for some strange reason, he'd go crazy barking frantically towards the direction of the sheep's enclosure at night. Having worked with animals even before I moved to the farm, I knew that my dog's panic was nothing to take lightly, and one Thursday he was so frantic that he even started hurling himself against the door. Also, the sheep were bleeding so loud I could hear them from inside the house. All of this prompted me to go and investigate what was happening. It was around 10 at night when I reached for my shotgun and headed towards the sheep's enclosure. Jack ran ahead of me and seemed to stop at a distance, growing ever more frantic. Little did I know, 
We were both about to experience the most terrifying night of our lives. As I caught up to and came closer to where Jack was, a seven-foot silhouette greeted me, and what I saw was so ghastly and shocking that I froze in my tracks. Jack wasn't doing any better and kept a safe distance from the creature and barked at it like I've never heard him bark before. The creature's shape resembled something you'd expect to see in a Bram Stoker novel, and had I not been as close to it as I was, I would have probably thought it was a very large bear. It had a face no different from that of the timber wolves that came out into the farm, but that was about it as far as similarities go. Its body. Especially its torso resembled that of a man. It had long human-like arms that almost went as far down as its ankles, with hominid-like hands that ended in extremely large claws. Its face stared at us in a grimace that I couldn't tell if it was about to lunge at us or was making sure we didn't come any closer. And just for the record, I had no intention of doing that. Its lower body was more wolf-like, but what stood out the most was its bipedal gait, and the way it stood never deviated not even once during our encounter, which made me realize that it must always use two legs and not four. I couldn't look away from it as it faced off with my dog, who was going absolutely berserk. The creature responded by making a blood-curdling sound that sounded more like a man moaning, or crying, or screaming. It was hard to say which. More human than any sound a canine would ever produce. It stood there in a territorial standoff with my dog, neither one moving an inch until eventually Jack mustered up the courage to advance toward it, calling its bluff and sending the creature bolting towards the woods. I couldn't believe he did that. Soon after the creature ran off, I grabbed my phone and called 911. Jack and I stood frozen in place and didn't even have the wherewithal to get ourselves back to the house. We literally couldn't think. I waited for the police from the nearest town to arrive. They came about an hour after the incident, at around 11 at night, and they confirmed that the encounter did happen, but they couldn't confirm which species of animal did it. They were able to confirm because they found a dead ewe just outside the enclosure, and around it was a strange set of tracks. The tracks headed off into the woods exactly where we watched it run off. I heard one officer whispering to another that the tracks looked strange since they were too big to be a wolf. And I also heard him say that it appeared that the creature walked off on two legs instead of four. I didn't sleep that night and haven't slept well since. Every time my dog barks in the early dawn hours, I think of this encounter. It's definitely a trigger that brings me right back to that day. Unfortunately, it happens way more often than I'd like. I'm hoping that one day I'll get past it all. But for now, I'm just doing the best I can. I can't believe I'm telling this story. But I've got to get this off my chest. My sister and I have always been close. When we moved out after college, we stayed in roughly the same area, so we could visit each other often. Well, that was until 2019 anyway, because she moved several hours north for a new job. I promised I would drive up to see her and her new place as soon as I could, but the pandemic hit, and I had to delay my trip for about a year and a half. When I was finally able to go, I was so excited. I was looking forward to seeing my sister and getting some peace and quiet. Two days before I was supposed to go, Janet called me and she seemed, I don't know, a little off. She teased me about little things like remembering to pack my toothbrush and extra socks, but she sounded kind of nervous. Then she told me that it was very important that I get an early start, so I would get there before dark. I brushed it off because she's always made fun of me for being a late riser. But then she repeated it and said it was serious because the road to her house always gets dark super fast. She even made me promise that I would leave early to get there before sundown. I didn't see why it was such a big deal because I drive home from work at night all the time, but I figured she was just being a typical overprotective big sister, so I promised. We said goodbye and hung up. Fast forward to the day of the trip. I set my alarm early, but it didn't go off, so I overslept and had to start way later than I wanted. I felt bad because I'd promised, but it wasn't really my fault anyway, so, oh well, right? 
At first, nothing out of the ordinary happened, but once I left the city and started on that long stretch of highway that cuts through the middle of nowhere, some weird stuff started happening. I'd look at the time and then I'd blink, and it would be like 30 minutes later, or my radio would cut out suddenly or switch channels on its own. The longer I drove, the more frequent the weird stuff became. It started off slow, but ramped up to something happening every couple of minutes. And then the sun set. Okay, I thought Janet was over-exaggerating when she told me about this, and you probably think I'm over-exaggerating now. But I swear it was practically instantaneous. One minute it was sunshine, and the next I could barely see in front of me, even with the headlights on. It was like the night just slammed down on my car. I must have gotten confused at some point because I somehow found myself driving down a narrow side road away from the main highway that I was supposed to take. It cut right through the surrounding woods and the trees were practically touching the sides of my car. I thought about trying to turn around, but I quickly realized it wasn't possible. I checked my GPS app and saw that if I just kept going for a couple more miles, there would be a spot where I could merge back onto the main road. As I drove, I started getting this really creepy feeling like I was being watched. I told myself that I was just tired and spooked from the long drive. I mean, I was in the middle of nowhere at night. Nobody was out here but me, right? I managed to calm myself down, but barely a minute passed before I heard the most terrifying sound ever. It was a high-pitched shriek, and I thought it was an animal, but somehow it sounded eerily human. It startled me so bad that I automatically pressed the gas a little harder. Everything happened so fast. First I felt the car dip, then there was a loud bang, then I jerked the steering wheel hard to the right to get away from the noise, but the car just sort of dragged. My heart was beating so fast I thought I'd die. It took me a second to calm down enough to realize that I'd probably just blown a tire. According to GPS, I was really close to the highway. I called Janet to let her know what had happened. She said she'd pick me up, but she sounded very worried. She said to walk the rest of the road to the highway and don't hang up. I was nervous about traveling alone and on foot, but it was a short walk, and I was still on the phone with Janet, so I felt a little better. I had almost reached the edge of the trees when this awful stench hit my nose. It was definitely something rotten and decaying. I don't know what death smells like, but I'm sure this must be it. Then it happened. A blood-curdling shriek just like before, but closer this time. Much, much closer. And it sounded like it was directly behind me. I turned around and I swear that for a second I saw a pair of glowing red dots like eyes, but they disappeared behind the trees. I freaked out and started sprinting for the highway. I don't know why, but somehow I was certain that something was pursuing me and that it was just letting me go because it wanted to. There were no more screams, but that horrible smell stayed. After that, it was a blur. I just remember vague flashes, reaching the highway, getting in Janet's car, walking in her front door. I don't think either of us said more than a couple words. The next morning, everything was weirdly normal. Janet was oddly chipper and gushed about being so glad to see me. My car was even parked in her driveway with all four tires intact. I tried to talk to her about what happened last night, but she just kept saying vague stuff about how it must have been a tiring drive and how she always had weird dreams after a long trip. Maybe it was just a weird dream. Janet and I had a great time catching up and swimming in the nearby lake. Everything was perfect until it was time for me to go home. I hadn't gone into my car since I got to Janet's place, and when I opened my car door I got hit full in the face by a horrible stench, rot, and decay. It was the same horrible smell as that night in the woods. If the smell is real, then what else about that night is real? I don't know if I want to find out.